The second module of the Leadership Development Institute is entitled Evangelism Explosion Commitment and Experience. My specific topic is identifying and honoring the companions God sends you. And in this session, I'll be taking cues from a book by Dr. Henry Blackaby entitled Anointed to be God's Servants, Lessons from the Life of Paul and His Companions. Aren't you grateful for the ministry companions that God has sent you and gifted you with? Uh, as I think back over the ministry that I've had with EE through the years, one such gift stands out as unique and definitely a gift from God. Um, it was in 1991 that we were still intent on establishing EE in every nation of the world. And Romania had been a closed nation for 50 years because of the dictatorship of Ceausescu. Well, finally, the nation was rid of him and the nation opened up to visitors from the West, and I was afforded the opportunity to travel and hold the first EE training clinic there in Bucharest, uh, Romania. Well, when I showed up, there had been a, a, a communication problem, and the pastor said, oh, I thought you were coming next month. And uh, we had brought five pastors from Romania to the United States, trained them in Fort Lauderdale, brought a couple of them out to California, equipped them, sent them with, our, we sent materials to them and so on. We were, you know, hoping that they would be ready for us with the clinic and had trained some people. And we showed up, they hadn't trained anybody. They didn't have any materials. They didn't know we were coming. And I stood there before that pastor, just crushed, thinking, what in the world are we going to do? He says, don't worry. Everyone's out of work. We'll get a crowd. We'll get some people here tomorrow for your clinic. And I went, oh, that's not the way you do a clinic. So I remember going down to the basement, getting on my knees on the stone floor there in the basement and crying to the Lord, saying, Lord, all this money, all this time, all this effort, all this distance, God, you've got to bring something good out of this. Well, the next day I show up and I say, um, well, we have no materials. How about paper? Can we pass paper out to the people? And he says, oh, you, we're very poor. Sorry, we have no paper to give them. And so ladies were taking grocery or, or receipts out of their purse, tearing them in half and writing notes on their little receipt pieces of paper. That's what they had. They had one transparency and one pen I could use. So I could, cont and then I said, well, pastor, you're going to be uh, translating for me, right? Oh, no, I'm far too busy. I have no time to translate for you. Do you ever, you, ever, you, know, you, you hear this expression, um, being slain in the spirit? Have you ever heard of being slugged in the spirit? That's how I felt. It was terrible. I pushed down the anger, you know, and he says, he says, but Anyone out here speak English? And one man raised his hand. And there were about 200 people who were there. It was amazing that they were grabbed that many people in such a short time. But one man raised his hand, and uh, the pastor brought him up. His name was George. And George began translating for me. And I'm teaching EE, -E, just as we teach it at clinics, you know. And George is going, Ken, that's fantastic, because the Bible says, I said, I know, George, tell the people. You know? <laughs> and, so, and so I could tell he was just so excited and enthused about what he was learning in EE. And uh, I thanked the Lord for him. I went, Lord, this is the guy who could be the director for EE of Romania. And sure enough, George Verza, you, many of you, you all know George Verza. And uh, he became a very close friend, great confidant, and a companion in ministry. And we saw 98 decisions for Christ that week. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, there was a Oh, Luis Palau, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Luis Palau had come to put on a, a, uh, uh, an evangelism you know, conference there at the stadium. And uh, they asked us to be the, the counselors on the field, and so hundreds more came to Christ. But the greatest thing was that George Furza became the director of Romania. We supported him for those first years. I'm, I'm, I don't know, my church may still be supporting George. And a couple years later, we sent one of our missionaries there to check on George, and they're driving downtown Bucharest, and my friend says to George, so George, how many people have been trained? Oh, since your pastor Ken was here. Yeah, how many? Oh, uh, three years, um, uh, 5,000. And my friend goes, no, wait, well, wait, George, 5,000? No, no, I don't mean how many have come to Christ. How many? Yes, 5,000 have been trained. In evangelism, all the pastors of the Baptist Union were trained and, and other groups and so on. And just an amazing thing. And now, of course, George is director of all of Europe and has done a fantastic job in leading people to Jesus and training churches and equipping people all over uh, Europe. And so God honors us by bringing us companions. And how do we honor them? 
How do we recognize the companions God sends us, and how do we honor them? Blackaby's opening sentence is this. A good starting place for identifying God-sent companions is a study of the lives of both Christ and the Apostle Paul. And this I'm going to do. However, as we look at the biblical record, we need to also be reminded that there are many other examples, instrumental and influential uh, companionship, of, of instrumental and influential companionship that we see in throughout Scripture. Um, so let's begin with the importance of companions in ministry. Adam had his Eve, right? Moses, his Aaron. Uh, David had his Jonathan. Gideon, his 300. Christ, his 12. Paul had Timothy and, and many others. And even the perfect one, Jesus, was, was aided, right, in his ministry by the presence of the disciples. For him, it was obviously not to fulfill anything that was lacking in him. Rather, it seems more to have been for the companionship and, and for the multiplied impact. Uh, that would take place when he was gone. For others in Scripture, it appears that the leader had real needs and liabilities fulfilled by the companions given him. Adam needed a completer, a helpmeet, as we're told. Moses needed a mouthpiece. David needed a protector and a confidant. Gideon needed his courageous warriors, and so God sent companions. He sends companions. Let's begin and start with Jesus. God sent him his companions. It was no accident. Jesus didn't just happen upon them. He found his disciples, first disciples, the day following his baptism. He issued a call to Peter and others after that unusual catch, miraculous catch of fish. Another he found in a tax office. Another was a physician. God sent him a team of companions diverse in their backgrounds, personalities, perspectives, and abilities and each added in their own way to the mission that Jesus had been called to fulfill. Jesus recognized them, he invited them, and he affirmed each one of them. Jesus knew God had sent him these companions. In John 17, verse 6, we read, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me, he says. And they have kept your word, and now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words which you gave me, I have also given to them. And they received them, and they truly understood and came, that, they, that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. Jesus knew that God had sent these companions. Their response to his ministry confirmed it. He identified them as gifts from God. And so the question that we have is this. Have you identified those that God has sent you? Will you recognize newly companions he sends to you? And will you honor them? If God thought it was important to send companions to Christ, who was and is perfect in every way, and it is no surprise then that he's going to send companions to assist in the ministries to which he's called us as well. And a point that I want you to recognize here is that God will send companions to you. Whereas Jesus was perfect and complete in himself, I hate to tell you, but you're incomplete. <laughs> You're imperfect and in need of people to complete and complement you. God knows it. These companions are going to assist you. They will affirm God's call in your life. They may offer wisdom, counsel, practical help, and encouragement. Think of Paul for a moment. God knew what Paul would face in ministry and what he would need to be able to fulfill it. Maybe this is why God sent him Luke the physician to help bind up the, to wind up the wounds that Paul would endure and, and to attend the sicknesses that he would come upon him. God prepared Tychicus and Apollos to go with Paul when, when he needed them and to go where Paul couldn't go as well. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla were companions who supported Paul and worked by his, by his side. God gave Timothy to learn from Paul so he could carry on when Paul's life came to an end. His letters to Timothy uh, helped codify important principles and teachings on the ministry and disciple making uh, from which we all benefit today. It would be wise for us to look, wouldn't it, at the gifts and skills that those God sends us, of those that God sends us. They would be indicators of what opportunities and challenges might lie ahead in our own ministries. Uh, I think of a man by the name of John Wilbanks. I marvel at how God sent me a close friend 
and uh, who became chairman of our elder board at a time when we were going through some difficulties, trials and travails, purchasing property and building a building and getting our permits uh, okayed and all of that. I met John on his first visit to our newly founded church and I could see that from our first conversation that he had a heart for God and the heart for the gospel and that we were gonna become good friends. And over the weeks then I finally, I realized that on top of the friendship God gave us, um, I discovered that John was a city designer uh, with great experience before planning commissions and with building permits and proposals and all of that. And, and he was sent for a purpose. He was very helpful in founding our church and he served for many years as an elder and even chairman of our elder board. He was a great encouragement and partner in the ministry and to this day he's a great supporter and friend. I want you to recognize also that the Spirit of God is the one who draws companions together. He guides companions together. He's the one who chooses them and, and, and places them together. It may be the leader who identifies the companion or the companion who's drawn to the leader, but it's evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit, the helper, in providing relationships that are needed for effective ministry. And so keep your eyes open, keep your hearts open, and to recognize the companions God's sending your way. For Paul, there were those who gave financially, those who offered food and lodging, those who traveled with him, who went before him and stayed on afterward to care for the ministry that he established in every place. Men and women, elders, servants, masters, slaves, rich, poor, they all helped. They all had their partnership in the work of the gospel uh, through Paul. God brought Paul all the people he needed to fulfill his ministry, and he will bring all the people you need to fulfill your ministry as well. In Philippians 4, verse 3, we read this. I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Henry Blackaby comments on this passage that the picture here is that of oxen yoked together, pulling the load uh, in, with all their strength, working together for good. He goes on to say that you can read through a list of nearly 30 names in, in Romans 16 of those whom Paul had as fellow workers in the kingdom of God. Fellow workers. See, they're a key ingredient for effective and fulfilling ministry. And this is one of the great blessings of working with Evangelism Explosion International, is it not? I think of all the friends, the companions that God uh, has given me through this ministry, and my heart is just filled with gratitude. We have the same heart, the same passion for the Lord, the same love for the Great Commission. And some of you listening or reading this teaching right now are among my dearest friends in the Lord. I need you, and you need me. We each have different gifts and personalities, and together we make up uh, an international ministry that's becoming more and more effective in equipping witnesses for Christ all over the world. So think through the companions God has sent you through this ministry. Aren't you grateful? Grateful for their help, their encouragement, their teaching, their support, their friendship. As I think of those friends in ministry who are contemplating retirement from EE, I'm saddened because I'm going to miss them. I know life moves on and things change, and I know God will bring others to step into their roles, but it reminds me of how much I value them as companions in ministry and how proud I am to have been able to see their progress and to have worked beside them. And so take time to thank God for the companions He sent you and thank them too. Another important point I want to make here is that God matches the companions He sends with the assignments that He gives. He matches us perfectly. In Acts 20, Luke tells us of, of he and Paul traveling through Macedonia on their way to Syria. He says that um, they were accompanied by Sophiter of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius and Derbe, and Timothy and Tychicus of Trophimus of Asia. And this comment just points up the fact that Paul's companions were men of differing backgrounds, personalities, and skills, nationalities. I imagine God provided each of them for specific reasons. And so let's just take a look at one that we know of, Tychicus. In Ephesians 6.21, we read this, But that you 
also may know about my circumstances, how I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you, Paul says. And then to the Colossians, he says, as to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. Paul needed a trusted and respected messenger who could be trusted to deliver important information about the condition and welfare of Paul to the churches. And Paul refers to him as a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, a great companion. Luke also mentions uh, Aristarchus and Gaius, and Paul needed men who would stand with him in the face of opposition, and these two had recently been with him at an outbreak of a riot in Ephesus. In Acts 19 and 29 we read, the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Of course, Dr. Luke also traveled with Paul. I'd mention him. I mean, imagine giving the persecuted Paul a physician who could bandage his wounds, care for him through his sicknesses, and, and nurse him back to health. Imagine that. Perfect companion for Paul. He needed these guys. And so God sends the companions we need to help fulfill the assignments he gives us. Paul also needed companions who would just sit with him in times of, of challenge, I'm sure, and in times of loneliness. I think of Silas. He must have been a great encouragement to Paul in Philippi, where they were beaten and then thrown into prison. Acts 16, 23, let me remind you of the story. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. They've been beaten. They've been put into chains. They're in the deepest, darkest hole in, of a dungeon. And there they're singing at midnight. Ecclesiastes reminds us that two are better than one, for they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. Right? You remember what happened next? Verse 26 continues, And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison house, the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he, knew, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I love the way that E.V. Hill used to tell this story. Silas, Paul says, it's dark in this prison. Oh, Paul, it is so dark in this prison. Silas, it's cold. Paul, I'm shivering to the bone. Silas, it's wet in this prison. Oh, yeah. Silas, there's rats in these prisons. Oh, Paul, I've never seen such big rats. Silas, I feel a song coming on. And Silas says, Paul, me too. You sing bass, I'll sing tenor. And you know the story. And they began to sing hymns in this dark dungeon of a prison. And as the story goes, God listens from heaven. And he says to the angels around him, shh, shh, I hear singing. And the angels say, God, Lord, you always sing, sing, hear singing. There's always singing in heaven. No, no, no. This singing is from earth. Listen to the singing. It's wonderful singing. And God begins to tap his foot. And the earth begins to tremble and shake. And the prison doors fall open. <laughs> and he goes on like no one else could. E.B. Hill, I love that guy. But, uh, you know, I imagine Paul could have sung alone. No, did he need someone to sing with him? I don't know, but Silas sure added the joy of great harmony to the concert Paul had that midnight. What an encouragement Silas must have been. Now, I've never been put into prison because of my ministry. Some of our EE staff have. But I have appreciated the presence and the encouragement of companions of mine through the trials and persecutions that I have experienced as a church planter, pastor, and evangelist over the years. You know, I discovered that when your church is growing in a little town and other churches are not growing in that town, jealous pastors sometimes don't act very Christian. <laughs> I, 
I also noticed that they can be real pests. And, and also, with my experience with my own congregation, my own flock, did you know that sheep can bite? <laughs> Got sheep bites to, to demonstrate that, to prove it, you know? But God sent me the companions I needed when I needed them. I think of John Pipkin. I was seated in my office just working on a weekly sermon, and there was a knock at the door, and, and a man new to our congregation came, and, and he had been burdened to pray for me. And so he wanted to pray for me. And then as he was leaving the office, he said, you know, Pastor, I'd like to pray for you weekly. I'd like to pray for you on a regular basis. I would like to meet with you and pray for you on a regular basis. And, and I was kind of skeptical. I didn't know this man, and I didn't you know, know where he was coming from and what his motives might have been and so on. But he began to pray for me, and we developed a little group uh, of men who would pray for me on a regular basis. And we met for over 10 years with that group. And the only agenda was to lay before them my visions, my fears, my hopes, my dreams, and then we would pray together. It was fantastic. I can't think of any greater encouragement and power that I needed as a church planner than, than the prayer that that little group offered me. My greatest need was in the establishment and operating phase and the mission of our church and so on was prayer. God knew it and He sent these men to me and our ministry grew. And uh, one of these three has now gone to be with the Lord. But uh, the other two continue to support me and continue to pray for me in my ministry today. Another point I want to make here and, and want you to consider is this. That the Holy Spirit will affirm the companions He sends you. How did I know that John, this John Pipkin, was, was really, had the, really the right motives and so on? Well, it, came, it, it became evident through the ministry that we began to share together and as I saw God working in his life and God answering his prayers and so on. Uh, we see the ministry, the Holy Spirit confirming companionship in Acts 13. We read of a, a prayer and fasting meeting among the disciples where the Holy Spirit says to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And they laid their hands on them. They sent them out as companions in ministry. And the Holy Spirit selected them. He called them. He confirmed through the disciples the work that he had chosen for them to perform. And the Holy Spirit chooses his servants, matches people to their tasks, and affirms the ones that he chooses. Now, don't you and I, you and I wish that it was always that clear and that easy, you know, that the Holy Spirit would just say, tell us who these people are. It's not always so clear whom we're to partner with and whom we're to avoid, is it? So how do we know? People come along and they look good and, or they look not so good. And we attach to some and we avoid others. I know I've made some mistakes in the past. I've chosen some who were not, didn't really turn out to be the servants that God had for me and, and there were disappointments. And I'm sure I've neglected some others who would have been great ministry companions had I had the mind to, to ask God about it. And so how can we know? What can we do better to discern those that God has sent us and chosen as companions in ministry. Well, let me try to give you a few indicators uh, to help you discern the God-given companions from the imposters. In Paul's introduction to his letter to the, Philipp the Philippians, <clears throat> I see Paul mentions at least six indicators of, this, of his relationship with them that I think can be indicators of true companionship in ministry. And this isn't a comprehensive list, obviously, but I can certainly identify with these uh, indicators, and I think you'll be able to also. <clears throat> and so six indicators of true companionship. Number one is thanksgiving. Look with me at Philippians 1, and uh, beginning with verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always offering prayer with joy. I thank my God. And so the first indicator is thanksgiving. Uh, when you find a companion that, that God has given you, you're thankful for them. They're a blessing. They're not a curse. They're not a problem. They're not a project. <laughs> They're a blessing. If you find yourself thanking God for them, they're His gift to you, right? Uh, if you have a partner in ministry, however, who's a pain, who's a problem, that's probably not the gift from God that you're looking for. Although he may have been sent as a challenge or a test, I mean, that could be as well. It mean, doesn't mean that God didn't send them, but they may not be the ministry companion you're looking for. Closely related to, related to Thanksgiving is joy. Verse 4 says, Always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. 
Do you find yourself filled with joy as you pray for your ministry companions? This is probably a companion God sent you. If there's anxiety and stress as you think and pray for them, this is probably not the companion God has sent you. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Working with a God-sent companion is a joyous thing. You enjoy working together. You each feel appreciated and built up as your work progresses. Gratitude and praise are present for what God is accomplishing through you. And God is honored and magnified in the ministry and in the relationship. Have you ever worked in an environment that was characterized by complaining and negativity? Not fun, is it? Where, where there's gossip and put-downs, where competition is the value rather than cooperation, it's stressful, it's terrible. Uh, if you're yoked up with or you're trying to yoke up with someone who brings uh, this kind of negativity into the ministry, this is not the companion God has for you. This one may have been sent by the enemy, but break off the relationship. Do whatever you can, whatever is necessary, to rid the ministry of so-called companions. Uh, a, third, a third indicator I find in this passage is faithfulness. Look at verse 5. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus faithfulness. They've been faithful. Paul saw his companions as participants in the gospel from the first day until now, he says. You see, you see that in them, and, and you have the confidence that God is working through their lives and will continue to work through their lives, and they're on a path of continued growth in him. Many potential followers came looking for a position with Jesus and his disciples, but Jesus didn't Asked them all to follow him. He didn't, he didn't bring them all along because their hearts were not right. Look at Luke chapter 9 <clears throat> and verse 57. We read of these reluctant disciples, three of them. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, um, Permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim, proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those who are at home. But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And so... <clears throat> They were divided in their loyalties, not truly committed to the call. In EE, we talk about finding disciples who are faithful, available, and teachable, right? And I think this sums up well the issue of this, of this issue of commitment. For years, I found my best companions in a 5 a.m. men's discipleship meeting I held. I would invite men and see how they interacted with the other guys and, and how they received study and ministry assignments and how they followed through and how they were faithful in attending. And I found that that early hour really separated the men from the boys, you know. If they showed up at 5 a.m. every week, uh, that said something about their commitment. They were committed companions I was looking for. Many of them joined our EE ministry and became leaders there. Another indicator I notice in this passage is unity. In verse 7, <clears throat> we read this. Oh. Philippians 1, verse 7. <clears throat> for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense of and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. Unity. You have one heart with them. Uh, this develops in times of trial. It develops in times of stress. It brings you together. Stress and trial don't divide you. They actually bring you together. And you see the grace of God working in and through them. This is a companion God sent you. Cooperative, like-minded, not competitive or restrictive. I had a pastoral staff member who was cooperative at first, but over a period of about a year and a half, two years, he began to be um, resistive, resisting me in the direction of the elders uh, at every turn. It got so bad that with every decision the leadership was making, 
we would have to consider, how's this staff member going to respond? Will this staff member be angry? Will, you know, and then we finally realized, wait a minute, who's running this ministry? <laughs> In a sense, this person was running the ministry because we were so concerned how they would respond, and we realized that we had to let this person go. It was one of the most difficult times in my pastorate. Um, I had to let him go and weakly face the number of angry supporters that he had who couldn't understand why godly men just couldn't get along. Well, if there's resistance, competition, life is just difficult, then this is not the ministry companion God's chosen for you. Uh, God's companions bring peace and harmony, like-mindedness, mutual support to your ministry, unity. A fifth aspect I notice here is, or indicator, is affection and care. Look at verse 8. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes, through right, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. When God matches you with a true ministry companion, there's a brotherly or sisterly love and affection built into the relationship. It's just there. When separated, you long to be with them, as Paul expresses here. You'd rather do ministry with them than without them. You appreciate one another. You care for each other. Verse 9 indicates that there's a feeling of goodwill for your companion in, in ministry. You just have them in your heart, and you pray for their continued growth and their progress in the Lord, and, and their, their life, that their life may be characterized by the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ and brings glory and praise to God. Now, this fruit of righteousness that Paul prays for here is probably that spiritual fruit you know, developed by the indwelling presence of Christ which we would call the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I mean, there would be those qualities of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? But it also reminds me of the fruit that Jesus refers to in John 15, where he says, unless you abide in me and I abide in, in you, you, must, you can bear no, bear no fruit, right? And so the true vine, being grafted into the true vine, that kind of fruit. And so I'd like to mention one more indicator of the companion God sends you that just, just brings to my mind, and that is, faith, that is fruitfulness. fruitfulness. Ministry companions are supposed to accomplish more together than your combined individual efforts could produce in and of themselves, right, separately. You know you're serving with God-given companions when there's success and when there's effectiveness, when there's fruitful ministry. It's evident that your ministry is being blessed by God. I've discovered some of my best ministry companions within our EE ministry. Faithful, available, teachable, right? Disciples who became productive semester after semester. Um, to me, they were obviously sent by God. And starting and maintaining a productive EE ministry in a local church is not always an easy thing, right? In fact, it can be one of the hardest things to maintain. Dr. Kennedy used to say that developing and maintaining an EE ministry in the local church is like trying to walk up a down escalator, right? You just got to keep on, keep on, keep on. The moment you stop, you go down the hill. And so it's not easy. And so we all know that we need a team of faithful companions in order to fulfill this ministry and it'd be fruitful. Well, early on in our ministry, Diane and I met a couple uh, actually through a natural childbirth teacher training course that we were taking, and we became instant friends with this couple. Immediately we saw their need for the Lord. And to make a long story short, they received the Lord, and they both gave their hearts to Jesus, and we continued to disciple them through the years. And, and the husband, Skip, accompanied me to my first EE training clinic, and he became hooked on EE just as I had. And God gave us one heart and a, and a great spirit of unity, he was an invaluable companion to me as we ministered together. We would lead EE on Tuesday nights, and then we would meet early before work uh, the next morning on Wednesday morning to evaluate how the class went, to take notes on our, on our note page, and we would put them in a file for the next semester so that we would continually get better. And we did this for years, just continue to reevaluate every morning after EE so that we would, would do things with excellence and that God would bless our ministry. What a great companion he was. And you know, our ministry began to grow, and uh, 
our second semester, we became a we became qualified as a clinic base. I mean, we already had enough trainers and so on. We had our first international clinic. We began to send people all over the world through EE. We'd identified like-minded disciples, worked hard with them. We multiplied a core of trainers and turned our community upside down and began to reach the world for Christ. This led to planting a church in a neighboring town that grew from an initial 20 people to 1,000, that little rural farming community. I couldn't have done it without my buddy, my companion, Skip and the other faithful companions that God sent us. And so I can look back and see all these characteristics of God-given companionship present. Thankfulness, joy, faithfulness, unity, affection and care, fruitfulness too. And I'll always cherish those early days of that productive EE ministry. And Skip's gone on to be with the Lord now, but his wife uh, continues as a faithful servant and a partner with both her prayers and her financial support for our ministry today. Ministry with the companions God sends you will have the characteristics and indicators of joy, thankfulness, faithfulness, unity, affection, and care, and fruitfulness. There'll be a positive uplift, there will be this positive uplifting attitude with mutual support and encouragement. And you know uh, that you have the companions that God sends you when you see them. Without them, you won't accomplish uh, anywhere near what you would with them. And so keep your eyes, your ears open, your hearts open. God's sending them your way. And so once we have identified those companions, then how do we honor them? How do we show them honor? And so how to honor your companions in ministry? I'd say, number one, just be a good steward. You know, be a good steward of the gifts of companionship that he sends you. God has sent these people to you. He sends you a ministry companion. He assigns you with a stewardship. He's entrusting them into your care. And so you're responsible to maintain the healthy relationship, to do what you can to encourage and to build them up and, and in the Lord. And as we read in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Keep watch over their souls. Uh, that's our stewardship. And, um, and we'll give an account to how we treat them. So what are some of the ways that we can honor these companions that God sends our way? First, number one, I think we need to acknowledge the companions God sends us. Very simply, just recognize them. Thank them for their partnership. How often we minister with people and we never get around to thanking them for the work that they put in and, and for, the, for the way that they encourage us. And so thank them and thank God for them too. I think we dishonor God and we dishonor them when we do not thank them. Secondly, treat your companions as fellow workers. I think it's important that we see ourselves as fellow workers and not as authoritative bosses over people. There's only one boss, right? And, and only one authority in our lives. We're not it. His name is Jesus. And the rest of us are fellow citizens with Christ and fellow servants in the ministry he's given us. I've seen too much discouragement and disunity stemming from people in places of authority who lord it over those that are put into their, their charge. And so rather than building up their team, they demand, they threaten them into submission. I never see Jesus treating his disciples this way. In fact, we see just the opposite, don't we? And so he leads them. He doesn't push. He feeds them. He doesn't demand they feed him. He washes their feet. He asks for no servitude in return. How different he is than what we normally see in the world and even in the church and Christian organizations around us many times. And so we honor our, com our companions by treating them as fellow workers. Third, we honor our companions by being servant leaders to the companions God sends us. Jesus was the servant leader who said, I came to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. In such a model, your companion is placed above you in the organizational chart, right? Not beneath you. You know what I mean? The classic organizational chart has been so burned in our consciousness that, that it not only dictates our corporate and organizational structures, it also colors our behavior with the companions God sends us. This shouldn't be. Don't place yourself at the top of the pyramid and expect your companions to support you, to serve you, to, to meet your needs, your desires, your wants, your priorities. 
Place yourself at the bottom of the chart as one who lifts the others, who supports, who encourages, who resources, who enables those above you to do a better job in the ministry that God has given them. Do you tell your companions what to do, or do you ask them for their opinion? Do you demand they go in a certain direction, or do you seek the direction of the Lord together? Uh, are you always telling, or are you also listening? God can speak through your companions as well as He can speak to you directly, right? Telling discourages, but listening builds up. Demanding your way discourages. Discovering God's way together affirms your companionship. Blackaby puts it this way, we should love our companions, care for them, protect them, and, and help them grow in the grace of Christ as best we can. We are to pray for them, he says. Encourage them, inspire them, and challenge them to be what God wants them to be. We are to lead them by example, love them as brothers and sisters in Christ, and serve them as Christ served his disciples. Wouldn't that be a much better place to minister and, and a better way to serve around the world? Honor them. Number four, use the ministry to build people. Do not use people to build your ministry. It seems so easy, simple. I truly believe that many have failed in ministry because of the way they've treated their companions, the companions God sends them. People in places of authority in the church and in Christian organizations can be tempted to see people as a means to an end. They can begin to use people to build their ministry. Rather, it ought to be the other way around, right? We, we should see ministry as a way to build people up. Do not use people to build ministry. Use ministry to build people. In fact, don't lose sight of this. People are our ministry. The companions God sends us are not our servants. They're servants of Christ. They're fellow servants of the one who called them and called us. Treat them as such. And so acknowledge them. Treat them as fellow workers. Serve them. Build them up. And lastly, love the companions God sends you. Brothers and sisters in Christ are to love one another. In this way, we honor the companions God sends our way. In 1 John 4, 7, we read this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Very simple, isn't it? Honoring the companions God sends us means loving them, pure and simple, loving them. Let me share three more passages in closing, and, and just let's, let's just let the, the Word of God mold us. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even to the point of death on a cross. Look also at what Jesus said on this topic in Matthew 23, in verse 10. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whomever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whomever humbles himself shall be exalted. And when he had finished washing the feet of his disciples, remember what he said in John 13? Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the teacher and Lord, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than him who sends him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. You are blessed if you do them. Your companions are blessed too. And you are blessed if you'll love and so honor the companions that God sends your way. Let's pray together. 
Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the companions that you send our way. Thank you for the help that they offer. Thank you, Father, for the way they build us up and they encourage us and they hold us up, Lord, and they pray for us and they complete us and they complement our ministry. And uh, God, they have strengths that we don't have. Thank you, Father, that, that there is a, an affection that you build between us. We love these companions you sent us. Thank you, Father. Help us to acknowledge them. Help us to identify the ones that you've sent us and help us to honor them in a way that builds them up and brings glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.